Thank you, Larry. Um, as Larry mentioned, I am a uh, reformed peace officer. <clears throat> I worked for the Monterey County Sheriff's Department, uh, hired in 1977. Went through the ranks uh, through patrol, canine handler, field training officer, and the coroner's office, which was quite an eye-opener. Got promoted to patrol sergeant, and then eventually promoted up to detective sergeant. As a detective sergeant, I supervised sex crimes and homicide investigations. So between the coroner's office, detective sergeant, and you know, almost a 30-year career in law enforcement, I've had uh, the occasion to investigate a lot of, of crimes, a lot of serious crimes. Well, I retired in 04 and uh, moved up to Trinity Center love it up there. My captain at the Sheriff's Department had already retired up there and now he's the assistant chief in the fire department in Trinity Center. So Roger kept bugging me to join his fire department and I resisted and I resisted and finally in 06 I told Roger, I said, okay, I'll tell you what, I will join your fire department, I will help you fight fires, I don't want to have anything to do with all that medical crap. Right, so today I'm a paramedic. <laughs> yes, um, work for Trinity County Life Support. Pretty part-time right now, but uh, I was a full-time employee at uh, Trinity County Life Support. I run an ALS ambulance out of Trinity Center Fire, uh, along with my very capable crew, and I also belong to Coffee Creek Fire. And one of the things that I've found is that our EMS responders don't really have a working knowledge of evidence, how to recognize evidence, how to preserve evidence, and perhaps most importantly for many of us is how to be good at these skills but keep ourselves out of court. Uh, I've been testifying at various levels in state courts since 1974, and I still don't like it. I would rather not have to go to court and testify. And so part of the goal today is to not only learn how to recognize and preserve evidence um, at the EMS level, but how to stay out of court when you do. Now, there's no guarantees. It really depends on your level of involvement, what you found, how you found it, how you handled it. But we'll talk about some of the things that you can do to make it a little less likely that you're going to be in court. So who cares? We're in Northern California. It's a small community. Um, I'm sure any of you that have been doing EMS for any period of time have had an opportunity to come in contact with a victim of a crime, probably a violent crime. Charlie Manson. Charlie Manson was involved in the uh, Tate-LaBianca homicide. Seven homicide victims attributed to Charlie Manson and his crew. And he is currently still in state prison. Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. One of, by the way, several Night Stalkers, but he's the most famous of the Night Stalkers. And Richard Ramirez has been, has had 13 murders attributed to him, um, five attempted murders, and 11 sexual assaults, along with a slew of other various crimes. David Berkowitz, son of Sam, also known as a 44 caliber killer. David Berkowitz, attributed to 60, mur or, I'm sorry, six murders and seven attempted murders. He's the one that uh, said that his neighbor's dog was telling him to commit these murders. He later recanted that and said it was just his way of trying to get out from some responsibility, although he uh, easily admitted that he was the killer. Ted Bundy. 
Ted Bundy was involved with at least 30 homicides. He admitted to 30 homicides. Experts think there were many, many more. What do these people have in common? Along with a guy by the name of Daryl Rich. Anybody know the name Daryl Rich? Got one person, couple people. I see four, five, six hands going up. Daryl Rich had four homicide victims. Daryl Rich is a serial killer who was operating in Shasta County. How many other homicides happen in our jurisdictions? Well, I'll tell you what, the first question that I put up here is what do these people have in common? And that is that even with Ted Bundy, EMS was involved in their cases. EMS responded to one or more of their victims. Ted Bundy's victims were almost all found as skeletonized remains, except his first known victim, who was a woman who was attacked in bed late at night, beaten with a metal rod that was taken off of her bed frame. She was assaulted, sexually assaulted with a speculum. She got very serious internal injuries. She was in a coma. And when she recovered, she never really recovered. She has permanent brain damage. She was picked up by EMS and transported to the hospital. With today's technology, it could very well be that Ted Bundy would have been caught much, much earlier than he was. Now, I'm not faulting the investigators from back then, in the early 70s, but today, with DNA and other advancements, there are some real, real good opportunities to catch killers much earlier than we used to. And folks, we're not here just to talk about homicides either. We're talking about sexual assaults, simple assaults, really just about any kind of crime. And we'll talk about some specific types of crimes in a little bit. You're on a fire crew, perhaps an ambulance crew. You're dispatched to the scene of an unknown medical. Law enforcement is not available. And at this point, there's not really any indication that they're needed. You just have an unknown medical. This is the house that you arrive at. The driveway, garage underneath the house. So you are going to go to the house, go to the front door, and find out what's going on. Well, this nasty-looking dog here is not at all happy with you being there. And um, it's hard to tell in a photograph, but he's snarling and barking and doesn't want you there. The fact of the matter is that's my lab, and he's the friendliest dog you'd ever want to meet, but that's beside the point. So you go back downstairs. You find this door to the garage open. Go into the garage. Go through a door at the back of the garage into a walkway behind the garage, and there's a stairway. You go up the stairs into a hallway. You look to your right. There's a couple of doors. They look like they're closed. But you hear some sounds from behind you, kind of a whimpering, crying sound. So you turn around. There's a door. Go through that door. First thing you see on the left is a restroom. Go in. There's a shower. No victim there, no patient there. Come back into the bedroom, and this is what you see. A little closer look. Things are starting to look a little out of place now, right? A little out of ordinary. Come around the corner over here, and what you eventually find is this woman who tells you she's been raped and beat up. So do you need law enforcement now? Yeah. Are you going to wait for law enforcement? It depends. Probably not. This woman has been traumatized. She's been beat up. She's hurt. 
And I think most of you would do the same thing I would do, and that is let's get her on the way to the hospital. All right. So that's a fairly, actually, common scenario. SSV, NorCal EMS, both have written protocols on handling crime scenes. NorCal EMS also has a protocol on handling sexual assaults. If you haven't read those in a while, you should probably pull it out and have a look. Gives you some good general guidelines on how to take care of crime scenes. However, any doctors in the house, I apologize. This is tongue in cheek, but let's face it, doctors really aren't so much bound by protocols like we are. They can do what they need to do, how they need to do it. We used to have a doctor who was our, uh, on our fire department, and he essentially was told, you're a doctor, you do whatever you need to do. And he did. So who's out there? Who is EMS? All of these people are EMS. Fire, even the cops, are EMS. And fire is part of EMS if you consider EMS to be the ambulance. Well, that's not really the case. I think you all know that. The main thing is that we're all on the same side. We're all trying to accomplish the same thing. And what we need to do is be willing to work together with each other. Whether you work on an ambulance and have to, uh, and hopefully want to, cooperate with the fire and the cops, or if you're a cop, you need to cooperate with fire and uh, ambulance folks. We had a case of homicide in Monterey County one time where the uh, uh, let's say the fire department guys were less than cooperative. They decided to wander out and have a look at our homicide scene, which was a, a male who was dead in a field. And um, they came back out of the scene after being told not to go in there. And those guys all lost their boots for a couple of weeks because they left footprints in that field that had to be compared and eliminated. So... You know, guys, we could have done it the easy way. And I have to tell you, my son was one of those guys. So, you know, uh, it happens. It happens. So we try to work together. Where do we find crime scenes? Well, the obvious thing is the scene, right? Where we find the patient is usually the crime scene. But as soon as we take that patient and move that patient to an ambulance, now the transport becomes a crime scene. Our victim is a crime scene. And when we get to the hospital, the hospital can actually become a crime scene. And I don't mean that in the literal sense where, in that that's where the crime occurred. I mean that we now have evidence in our ambulance or we have, am we have evidence at the hospital. That's a crime scene, something that, that contains evidence. Motor vehicles, boats, aircraft cat crashes. Some of the biggest crime scenes that I had to work were airplane crashes. And the evidence is a mess, but you go in and, you know, uh, one particular one outside of Monterey, a jet crash, the biggest part we found was a foot. But that was our crime scene. The other point that I'm making with this slide is that not, you don't always have to have a crime to have what you should be considering a crime scene. In other words, an airplane crash may or may not be a crime. How many of you remember the airliner that crashed in uh, uh, northern San Luis Obispo after the guy with the gun went in, shot the pilots, and the plane went down? That was a crime scene. That was five minutes away from happening in Monterey County. Fortunately for us, it went down in San Luis, uh, San Luis Obispo County instead of Monterey County, so we didn't get involved in it. But that's a crime scene. That's a plane crash. However, a lot of these things are accidents. And even though they're accidents, they still need to be handled like a crime scene because it's important. It's important to family to know what happened. 
It's important for insurance companies to know what happened. And it's important to rule out an actual crime. Same thing with industrial accidents. Few are literally crimes, but they need to be treated as crimes. You're still, somebody I should say, is still going to do an investigation. So we protect those scenes, we protect the evidence. Assaults, all types of assaults are crimes. Very simple. But our victim and where the victim was assaulted has to be treated like a crime scene. You have sexual assaults, physical assaults, and homicides. You have suicides and uh, attempts. Do we know when we walk into a suicide that it is, in fact, a suicide? Even if there's a note. How many times have homicide victims left notes? Right? It happens. Don't need to beat this one to death. You, you, you just got a couple of really good presentations on uh, labs, one in particular that Mike gave us, and marijuana grows. Now, I know there's a lot of people that think, yeah, marijuana grows aren't crimes. You know, give it up. Well, how many times are there assaults and homicides connected to marijuana grows? It happens a lot. And as Mike pointed out, how many times is the national forest or our local um, locations, if you will, are litter grounds, labs. These are crimes. It's, uh, in Trinity County, we've got a heck of a problem right now with water theft, with water being diverted, um, chemicals being dumped into the ground, all kinds of just garbage being left laying around. And, you know, I'm sorry, but that's part of the problem with marijuana grows. And these are crimes that need to be investigated. What's our, what's our first priority? Our own safety. That's number one. We have to be safe. And if that means not going into a, a crime scene, then so be it. Um, I had a, uh, a case that was really just a, an accident, an ATV accident. The guy had a hole in his forehead big enough that I could hear an echo when I talked to him. And he had a friend there that was drunk, and the friend wanted nothing but to fight me. And because of that person, the patient had delayed care for about five minutes while I literally squared off with this guy and just, I was basically avoiding him. I didn't want to fight with him. I was ready to if I had to, but I didn't want to. Finally, his friends came and took him away. Oversimplified example, but scene safety, and of course with the labs, scene safety is very important. Shooting incidents, scene safety, don't go in it. Safety of others, including your partner, including other responders, including bystanders. That's really your second priority. After you're safe, make sure everybody else is safe, which might mean keeping people out of the scene. Then your patient welfare. Now, some people might argue that there are other things in between, and that's fine. A very simple, short list, but these are things that you need to be aware of and be careful of. Your patient welfare becomes after your, your safety and the safety of other folks in the area. And then, and then, integrity of the scene. If you have to destroy some evidence to properly care for a patient, so be it. I got chewed out big time by a detective one time because a, a knife had been moved. Well, you know, I'm sorry. That knife had to be moved so that I could take care of the patient. Plain and simple. Remember that law enforcement is in charge of the scene. Okay, very important distinction here of the scene. And that takes in the whole crime scene, but EMS is in charge of the patient the patient care. Don't let a cop tell you how to take care of the patient, just like you wouldn't tell the cop how to collect evidence. But we need to work together to make this happen. 
And then if it's a homicide, the medical examiner, or in California, uh, the coroner is in charge of the body. A lot of information on there. I'm not going to read it to you. I don't even recommend that you read the whole thing. But the last line is what I like. And that is, by doing the job well, you can actually keep yourself out of court. There's two ways that generally you're, you're not going to show up in court. The first is that you do such a bang-up job, and hopefully the cops do too, that the defense says, there's no way we can beat this, let's plead it out. And that's always great. The other way is what's called a stipulation. And that is that you do your job in such a bang-up manner that the defense says, you know what, I don't want or need this person on the stand. They're just going to make my client look bad. They did such a good job, I've got nothing I can attack. And so the defense and the prosecution get together and they state, you know what, we'll stipulate to what the EMS folks did at the scene. Now the other side of that is you do such a sloppy job and write such a lousy report that the defense looks at that and says, oh, I've got all kinds of ammunition here. I can beat this person up in court. Then you're going to end up in court because they're going to use you to get their client off the charges. Roy Hazelwood, really nice guy. Uh, I've spent some time with him, been to several of his classes. I drove him to the airport one time. We had a great talk. And uh, this guy is FBI, and it's just amazing the work that he and his partner have done. He's retired now. But he talks about the different types of evidence. Forensic, circumstantial, eyewitness, and direct evidence. In our discussion today, we're primarily concerned with forensic evidence and um, direct evidence. Forensic evidence, forensic being the word meaning legal, it's the little stuff. That's the stuff you got to go look for. That's the stuff you got to find and then test, compare the hair, the fingerprints, the little things that we in EMS are most likely to screw up. And it's not our fault in most cases, sometimes it is, but it's just, it's the little things that you really don't even know they're there. I had an arson case one time, I drove up to the scene, it was an outdoor thing, and I got all excited, I found tire marks at the scene. All right, I got out my camera, I took pictures, I was just getting ready to leave the scene, I looked at my patrol car, I followed the tracks all the way back, to where I had driven into the scene. I spent probably 20 minutes recording my own tire tracks. Did a pretty good job, but you know, it was cool. But I had another case, a, a robbery, where I spent the same amount of time taking pictures of some footprints, and that turned out to be what broke the case, was those photographs of those footprints. A recent parolee was out making traffic stops and robbing people. And it was that one footprint that I took a photograph of that made the case and put the guy back in prison for a long time. So that's forensic evidence. Circumstantial evidence. We let the cops worry about that stuff. Those are just circumstances that tend to implicate a person. Good example there is that the bad guy drove the same kind of car that was seen at the scene. Eyewitness evidence. Who thinks eyewitness evidence is the best evidence you can have? Don't raise your hand because you'd probably be wrong. All right. Unfortunately, eyewitness evidence is very poor evidence. It relies on people's memory, their eyesight. Anybody see uh, My Cousin Vinny, the movie? Yeah, I love that movie. In fact, I watched it just the other day twice in the same day. And that's a great example. What is this on your window? Oh, that's dirt. What is this? Oh, that's a tree. What are these? Bushes. And you saw the bad, you know, the, my, my clients through all this crap and you're making an eyewitness identification? 
I don't think so. Anyway, but here's the nice thing about eyewitness evidence, and that is it can be corroborated with forensic evidence, right? You get the forensic evidence that proves your eyewitness is right, and that's great. And then last is direct evidence. That's a physical thing that's not forensic evidence, but it's a physical thing, and it tends to indicate that a person was at a crime scene and responsible for that crime. So here are some things to think about when you're handling evidence. As well as you can protect the evidence that's at the scene, including the patient, him or herself. A lot of your physical evidence, especially your forensic evidence, is actually going to be on your victim. Handle clothing as little as possible. Separately bag each item of clothing. Now, just like Mike said earlier, I'm not trying to turn you into an investigator, a cop, whatever. But sometimes you just, you have to remove clothing from a patient and you don't have the cop standing there for you to just hand it to him. So at the very least, you probably are not gonna, probably are not gonna have paper bags with you, but you can take each item of clothing and set it someplace separately. Preferably on a sheet, paper, something, so that you're not, you know, if you take it off, if you take a pair of pants off of a patient, put it on the rug right next to the patient, now that those pants are gonna pick up evidence from forensic evidence, fiber evidence, whatever, from the ground. If you do have paper bags, separate them. If any of you haven't heard this one yet, well, we got some students in here. Guys, don't cut through bullet holes. Don't cut through the, the stab wounds. Let those things stay intact. Cut around that kind of stuff. Bloody items. Ideally, blood, bloody clothing is allowed to dry and then it's packaged, put away. We don't have that kind of time. It's not our job. But we don't want to put bloody items or anything really that's biologic in a plastic bag. You're just going to ruin everything about it. If your patient's bleeding, especially in a sexual assault, try to save that evidence by putting a chucks underneath the patient and then later on that can be carefully handled, dried, and kept as evidence. Second bullet point, very important, especially in sexual assaults. Now, a lot of times, by the time we get there, the patient has done these things already. She's already cleaned herself up, maybe taken a shower. Nothing we can do about that. But don't let them do any more cleaning. Get them to the hospital. <clears throat> don't allow them to comb their hair, brush their teeth, etc. Very important. Gloves, not only do gloves protect you, not only do gloves protect the, protect the patient, but they keep you from messing up or leaving, I should say, fingerprints. But even more important today with DNA is that gloves protect DNA evidence. But what's really important with DNA evidence is that you change gloves after each time you handle potential evidence. Puts quite a burden on us to change our gloves very, very often, but it has to be done. Uh, we used to do search warrants. We'd have boxes of gloves with us, and every time we found something, we would bag it, take off our gloves, put on another pair of gloves. We had a homicide scene with two victims in a, in a house. Every room in that house was searched, and I mean, I got the living room, and we're going through drawers and everything, and gloves were just being changed left and right. And don't forget, you gotta put those things in the garbage that you brought with you, not the patient's garbage, all right? Gloves, change them often. If you pick up an item of evidence 
wearing a pair of gloves and maybe you put it in a paper bag, take off those gloves, put on a new set of gloves because you don't know what might have DNA on it. And as soon as you use the same pair of gloves to touch a second item, you've destroyed the DNA as far as evidence goes. You've contaminated it. The chain of evidence is very important. Just because you're on scene and just because you see a piece of evidence, just because you perhaps pick up a knife and move it, doesn't necessarily mean your name has to go on the chain of evidence. If someone takes possession of something that is a piece of evidence, then their name needs to go on the chain of custody. And when you take that item and hand it to the cop, the cop then signs as the second person who is in possession of that. And every time it changes hands, there's a new signature. If you get a very important piece of evidence that you're turning over to a peace officer, ask them about signing a chain of custody form. Because if they don't think about it, which they should, but if they don't, that piece of evidence might be lost in court later on because the chain of custody was disturbed. Very important. Confidentiality. We write PCRs, we put the information in a PCR, we can share that PCR with certain individuals, but what you can't do is start talking to people about this case. You shouldn't be talking to people about any of your patients, whether it's a crime or not, but don't be talking to folks. One of the things that they uh, have discovered is like these officer-involved shootings that, were invo that have been going on here recently. A cop who probably was never at the scene, who probably has no personal knowledge of the shooting incident, goes into a Denny's and starts talking to his buddy, fellow cop, about what happened. Well, that gets back to the defense attorney who then calls that cop in to court and asks that cop, officer, isn't it true that you said such and such? And the cop, hopefully being a truthful person, said, uh, yes, I did. Did you know that to be a fact? Were you at the scene? Were you an investigator? That's what happens when you start talking to people outside of the folks who are directly involved in the investigation. In other words, don't go home and start talking about what you saw. Don't go to lunch with your crew and start talking about the case. Keep that stuff confidential, and that'll help keep you out of court. I don't know about this fact that I found. I do know my daughter's a 911 dispatcher that it is true that, that often the person who committed the crime is calling 911, especially in homicides. It's not unusual. They either have a, a feeling of guilt and they feel like they have to call and confess to what they did, or they feel they're smarter than the cops and they can stick around and play the game. But what that means is that you're going to a scene where the perpetrator is still present. So be very careful about talking to people at the scene, even if they're family members, because that family member might be involved. Now, you know, if it's a simple assault, um, that's one thing. But homicides, you've got to be really, really, really careful who you talk to about the case. PCRs, this is one of my little pet peeves. I read a lot of PCRs, and what I find is that a lot of our EMS folks are going to these crime scenes and writing up a PCR just like they would to an abdominal pain of a 60-year-old woman. 
the facts, just the facts, but not all the facts. Because when you've got a criminal investigation, a lot of what is said is very important, and it was said to you. So where you might not normally put something in a PCR that was said to you, in a criminal investigation, it can be very important that you do so. Your observations. We went through the crime scene. What did you see in that crime scene? Most of what you saw in that crime scene that I walked you through at the beginning of this presentation has absolutely nothing to do with patient care, but might it be important to an investigator, to a criminal investigation? Yeah, very important. You're the one that saw it. And it's just like Mike said when he came up here, take some photographs, take some video. Be careful, be careful doing so, but yeah. Some of the other things that you want to put in your PCR. Everybody know what scene staging is? Scenes of homicides, especially serial killers, you'll often find the victim placed in unnatural positions. And if you've seen enough death scenes, you know what a person who has died looks like. And you know when a scene has been, been staged. You know, they're two completely different things. Uh, the Hillside Strangler in LA loved to stage a scene. Put uh, their, there's actually two of them. Um, put their, their victims in very strange and usually sexual positions. And that's scene staging. But scene staging is also moving things within a scene to make it look like a suicide when in fact it was a homicide. Or, you know, the classic, uh, this was obviously an accidental death. I mean, look at this. Well, that scene staging, somebody committed a homicide, staged the scene to look like an accident. At the scene, be aware of these things. Don't take stuff in you don't need. Limit the number of people that go in. Dying declarations, a very, very important part of a homicide investigation. You have a victim who you're transporting in your ambulance or you're taking care of at a scene. This person says, you know what? I'm dying. I'm dying. My brother-in-law shot me. That's a dying declaration. And if that, if that person survives, that's fine. That person can testify to that later. But if that person dies, you can testify that that victim who ended up dying said this to me. And one of the first things they'll ask you is, did that person believe he or she was dying? And then you will say, yes. That person said to me, I'm dying. I know I'm going to be dead in five minutes. This is what happened. That's a dying declaration. Can you imagine anything more important than getting an accurate dying declaration and, and documenting it? Very, very important. All right, so got about three, four minutes left. What I'd like you to do is think about the answers to these questions based on the crime scene that we walked through a few minutes ago. How many vehicles and what kind were in the driveway? Do you remember? And where and how were they parked in the driveway? Now everybody knows the answer to this one, right? That was Max. Max is cool. All right, but his demeanor as I described to you was that he was angry. How about this one? The door from outside in the driveway into the garage. Was it open and how far? Could that be important? Very much so. How about the lights in the garage? Did you have to reach in and turn the lights on or were they already on? You gotta remember these things. Very, very important. So going, leaving the garage itself and going into the back walkway, how about that door? Open or closed? How far? Everybody remember what was blocking the access in the walkway back there? Yeah, 
Okay, the ladder. How about those two doors in the hallway that you did not go through? Closed. The door to the master bedroom. Okay, Larry says it was open. How far was it open? Yeah, a couple inches, if that. Door to the bathroom, I heard open. Anything unusual in the shower? Oh, did you like my, my party shower wit? Yeah, that's my party shower. When I did the remodel, I wanted a big shower. I got it. But what was in that shower? Say again? Yeah, a little trash can. This could be a whole list of things. Pantyhose, some underwear. It, how many of you, be honest now, saw the knife? Okay. There was a big old kitchen knife on the uh, dresser. This one is very important. What do you think? One side? I see one side. Why is that important in a rape investigation? Who cares? A lot of rape... Complaints are he said, she said. And what he, one of the things that he might say is, it was consensual. I spent the night. I was there all night. Was he? Probably not. Because the bed was only slept in on one side. We're going to just go through these. and All right, so Jeep and the truck backed in. There's the nasty dog. That door is pretty wide open. You can see up there. I know it's hard to tell, but that door is pretty wide open. The lights are on in the garage, and that door is wide open again. There's the ladder block in the walkway, and that's just upstairs into the house. There's those two doors that they were closed. Very good. Bedroom door only open a couple inches. There's the uh, restroom. That door is wide open, and the uh, shower with the garbage can in it. Let's get a little better view. There's some uh, indication that somebody rummaged through the, uh, through the bedroom, went through the drawers, um, some underwear, pantyhose, bed slept on one side, and our victim. So that was a real quick overview of evidence. Hopefully you can... Identify evidence when you see it, take care of it, avoid moving it if possible, point it out to the cops, and wear gloves and change gloves, change gloves. Real quick, any questions? Feel better about maybe handling a crime scene? Speaking of crime. All right. Speaking of crime, uh, would you all do me a favor? If you ever respond to my house and you're making note of these things in the master bedroom. Please don't mention the trapeze, all right? You'd be doing me a huge favor. That was there when we moved in, I swear. I have a question. Yes. Maybe two questions. As you're changing gloves often, do you toss your gloves or do you put the gloves you use to pick up the knife in with the knife in whatever you're using? To... Not that we should be picking up knives, but... You can put the gloves in with the object that you're saving as long as you've got a container that that object is going into. Take a knife, you put it into a bag, you can put the gloves with the knife. But if you're taking that knife and just setting it aside, don't take your gloves off and throw them over there with the knife. Throw them away. All right. Something just occurred to me. Do we look like Sonny and Cher right now? Which one do you want to be? I'm taller. You're taller. You're share. Okay. okay. You got it. My Whip. second. Oh, do we have another question? Whip. Assuming that the clothes are going to be in a plastic bag only temporarily, you can put them in a plastic bag. Just don't seal the bag up. Uh, for those that didn't hear, if you have a choice of putting clothing or any piece of evidence for that matter, in a plastic bag or no bag, 
put it in a plastic bag, but keep the plastic bag open. Keep air moving in that bag. And then hopefully the cops will later on take it and put it in a paper bag. My second question, and I know you're not a lawyer. You mentioned it. Mike mentioned it. Take pictures with your phone. In your opinion, does that mean everything on your device is discoverable by prosecution and the defense? Yes. Yes. You, you take the photographs, and ideally what the cop will do is take your phone and put it into evidence and then get the pictures off of it later. Now, what you can do, and I have done this myself, is taken photographs, download those photographs onto a CD and given the CD to the cops, and that, is, that works. That's absolutely fine. The only thing you have to testify to if you take a photograph is you come to court and a lawyer will show you that photograph and say, is this a, a true representation of what you photographed? And you'll say, yes, that is the photograph I took. And that photograph is admissible. And then there are no questions about why you surf ErnestBorgNineNaked.com? That, that was a long time ago. <laughs> yes, they can confiscate your phone if it contains evidence. Not just because you're at a scene and taking pictures of a cop beating somebody up. That, unless they can actually say why that's evidence, which really, if they're beating somebody up, it is. It's just evidence against them. Maybe. Thank you, Bob.